who is the black man? The black man in the West has ceased to be black, uh, not of his own volition, but he ha he's actually been stripped of his blackness. He, he has been stripped of the language of the black man. He couldn't speak the language of his own people. He had to speak the language of strangers. And today, he speaks the language of strangers. He knows nothing about, his, about the indigenous language of his people uh, prior to being brought into the Western Hemisphere. He has been stripped of the black man's name. He has been stripped of the black man's culture and uh, actually also stripped of the black man's history. And just as a tree without roots dies and becomes dead, uh, when a people become stripped of their history or their historic roots, they also become a dead. And for this reason, the condition of the black man in the Western Hemisphere has been that of a dead man. And this dead thing was also dehumanized. The slave masters robbed us of everything that we could use to prove that we were a part of the human family, the black family. And this is the condition that our people in the West are in today. The struggle in the states between the races has always been bloody, but it has been one-sided. The Negro has been doing most of the bleeding, but I believe he's beginning to feel that bleeding should be reciprocal. Uh, it should be done equally on both sides. Everybody should bleed. If, if, if the Negro is going to bleed, everybody should bleed. And I think he's beginning to see this. That it should be equalized. The struggle of the colored peoples of the world against the forces of Western imperialism and its agents has been going on for a long time. On the continents of North and South America, in Asia, in Africa, oppressed peoples have been waging a tireless campaign against domination at the hands of imperialists and their insane doctrine of racial supremacy. But at the very moment when the last outpost of colonialist barbarians seem most comfortable, at the very moment when representatives of the self-styled master race feel most secure and certain of continuing their vicious schemes of enslavement, our people are affirming their humanity. We are demanding an end to centuries of exploitation. We are proving that imperialism, far from being invincible, is now on its last legs. Indeed, throughout the world, the colored peoples are mobilizing and uniting their ranks to intensify and to speed up the certain death of colonialism and neo-colonialism. We are pre final showdown with the well-known enemies of human rights and human dignity. Today, intimidation through fear and the reign of the Ku Klux Klan is facing destruction. And what is the actual situation in the United States, where over 20 million colored people virtually live as a colonized nation under racist and economic oppression. Well, for the past 10 years, the struggle in America has been confined to what has been projected to the public as a civil rights struggle. And uh, in that context, it has remained a domestic problem. It has remained within the jurisdiction of the United States. And it has, and as such, it has been impossible for the Afro-Americans or American Negroes to try and enlist the support of other dark-skinned uh, people who are being oppressed the world over in, in that struggle. And the difference now uh, in the direction that the uh, struggle is taking from that, from the direction that the struggle has been going in in the past, there are many uh, of our people who are thinking more deeply and more broadly and are beginning to see the importance of lifting it uh, out of the national context or out of the domestic context or beyond the jurisdiction of the United States government. And the only way this can be done is by internationalizing the problem and, and putting it uh, at a level where it can be taken into the United Nations and then all of the other independent nations on this earth can involve themselves in our struggle and support us. And uh, the only way by this, of which this can be done, instead of it being called civil rights in the future, we're going to have to label it a human rights struggle or the struggle for human rights.
And as such, we can then take it into the United Nations uh, through the avenues that have been set up by the United Nations uh, Commission on Human Rights. Uh, we can take the, our problem before the United Nations in the same uh, manner that the problem of South Africa, Angola, Mozambique, Hungary, the Arab refugee problem, it, it becomes a world problem. And as a world problem, then the uh, uh, Afro-American or the so-called Negroes for the results because uh, it's not left up to the one who's responsible for it anymore, but it's, 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 it's uh, put at a level where the whole can see that our plight is wrong. It stood in our path in the, in the uh, past. It also makes a difference in the leadership. Those who have been posing as leaders of our people uh, in America in the past, won't, they can pose on this local stage where Uncle Sam is the master of the show and can prop them up and make them look good or make them look better than they actually are by giving them token gains and building them up uh, an image. But when, you st when they step onto the international stage or the world stage, then Uncle Sam can't prop them up anymore. And their ability or lack of ability becomes exposed and if they can lead us forward, they remain leaders. But if they can't, then they have to step aside and more qualified and bona fide leaders step up from the masses of our people and then we get more, uh, we get faster progress, we get more results. Malcolm X came from the masses as a genuine leader of his people. He was well aware of the false divisions planted between them, for he himself had overcome many of these artificial barriers to emerge as a voice which raised our strongest demands for freedom and justice in America. This man combined his recognition of the chief enemy of the African and Afro-American people with an objective knowledge of where our strength lay. He talks about the black intellectual, he talks about education, revolutionary education, he talks about the tasks of our women. Well in the past the, the uh, Afro-American or American Negro intellectual uh, perhaps uh, per permitted himself to be used in a way that wasn't really beneficial to the overall uh, Afro-American struggle. Mm -hmm. But I think today that these, I think today these uh, intellectuals have begun to uh, undertake a new appraisal of the problem, uh, looking at it as it actually is, and are beginning to see it more in the international context and the relation that it has with the African uh, struggle. And the African intellectual is beginning to look at the problem uh, in the African context and see that what might be good in one country uh, in order for it to be used in another country has to be rearranged. You take African socialism. Many of the African intellectuals that have analyzed the uh, approach of socialism are beginning to see where the African has to use a form of socialism that's... Uh, uh, that fits into the African context, whereas uh, the form that is used in a European country might be good for that particular European country. It doesn't fit as well into the African context. So I think the African intellectual is making that contribution and he's making it well. One thing that I uh, became aware of in my traveling recently through Africa and the Middle East, in every country that you go to, uh, usually the degree of progress can never be separated uh, from the woman. If you're in a country that's progressive, the woman is progressive. If you're in a country that reflects the consciousness uh, toward the importance of education, it's because the woman is aware of the importance of education. But in every backward country, you'll find the women are backward. And in every country where education is not stressed, it's because the women don't have education. So one of the things I became thoroughly convinced of in my recent travels is the importance of giving freedom to the woman, giving her education, and giving her the incentive to get out there and put that same uh, spirit and understanding in the children. And I, I frankly am proud of the contribution that our women have made in the struggle for freedom. And I'm one person who's for giving them all of the leeway possible because they've made a greater contribution than many of us men. And uh, one of the best ways that they can help is to encourage the man, uh, uh, try and inspire him to be more militant, and turn him away from being non-violent and passive and meek and, and Uncle Tomish. Make him uh, aware uh, that the black woman wants to see her man be a man instead of around here uh, using religion as an excuse to be a coward and uh, uh, some of the things that he's been reflecting here lately. Freedom by any means necessary was the battle slogan of Malcolm X. For he knew that in America, 
the condition of the vast majority of the 22 million black people is very close to the condition of 11 million Africans under the fascist South African regime. He also knew of the resources of the people of African ancestry outside of Africa. Time and time again, he called on our press brothers everywhere to fight against the type of slavery which the United States imposes on all of us. Most people, when we say Afro-American, uh, they think only of the Negroes in the United States. But they don't realize that two-thirds of Brazil uh, are, consist of people of African blood, which means they're also Afro-American because Brazil is in South America. And in all of these, uh, many of these countries in South America and Central America, and even in Canada, uh, they are heavily populated with people whose ancestors came from Africa. So when you total up the number of Afro-Americans, real Afro-Americans, uh, in the Western Hemisphere, there are perhaps a hundred million. And if these people ever unite among themselves, not only is it necessary for the Afro-Americans in the United States to be organized, but, uh, but it's also necessary for the Afro-Americans in the Caribbean or the, the Afro-Cubans, uh, the Afro-Brazilians. It's, it's necessary for all of them to be organized. And then once they are organized in each place, we have to organize among ourselves so that the Afro-American in the United States will be uh, working uh, in conjunction in a coordinated program with those who are in Cuba and those in Brazil and those in Venezuela and those throughout the Caribbean and Haiti and in the West Indian Islands. And in this way, we actually get strength. And it's not an accident that there's no organization existing in the Western Hemisphere that's designed toward that end. It would be, the, one of the, it would be a direct threat to imperialism as it really exists and, and to colonialism as it exists in the West. And one of the things that's going to help to bring this about is, the, is again, is the independence of Africa. And one of the only reasons in the, uh, that we in the West have never organized, we have hated our image and our African image. And because Africa has been in the hands of people who have created an image of Africa that's negative and hateful. And uh, it has been hateful to us. We haven't wanted to identify with it. But now that Africa is getting independent and in a position to create its own image and it's a positive image, uh, those of us in the West look at the African image and see how positive it is. We begin to identify with it. We become proud of, of Africa and we, we become proud of our African blood, our African heritage. And this is what is beginning to make the Africans in the Western Hemisphere today have, develop more race pride. And as, as this race pride develops, then it has the tendency to make us want to unite together and work together. And your Western imperialists and colonialists uh, consider this to be a grave threat more threat than uh, communism or Marxism or socialism or anything else. The Africanism is what they consider to be the real threat. Yes, undoubtedly, one of the major elements of the center of Malcolm X's revolutionary strategy is solidarity, the natural solidarity which must be restored between the Afro-American and his African brother in their common fight against a common enemy. The organization of Afro-American unity sees the only hope uh, for the black man in America uh, in a strong Africa and, and the necessity of the Afro-American becoming uh, inseparably linked with the uh, overall program that is, that's existing on the African continent. The two problems must, go, must be solved together and the two forces must go forward together. And so the organization of Afro-American unity has a program to link the Afro-Americans with the Africans and the Africans with the Afro-Americans. When I say Afro-Americans, I mean those throughout the entire Western Hemisphere. This is our only hope. Our hope is in a strong Africa. And when Africa is strong, our position in America will be one of respect. But if Africa is weak, we will never be in a position of respect in America. I, they used to have a saying that one doesn't have a Chinaman's chance. But they don't say that anymore. They used that expression back when China was weak. But now since uh, Mao Zedong has been successful in making China a strong country, uh, uh, the Chinese have more chance than anybody else. So this saying has become outdated. Well, just as it took a strong China to give a Chinese person respect, wherever that Chinese person is found on this earth, uh, when we get a strong Africa, uh, the person of African origin or African ancestry will be respected any place on this earth, even in America but he will not be respected in America until Africa is strong 
just as the Chinaman wasn't respected abroad until China became strong. He was the leader who knew that self-reliance is the only security for lasting freedom and independence. This is why he rejected the claims for white participation in the leadership of the Afro-American freedom movement. This is why he respected the example of the Chinese people in their revolutionary struggle. How did he view the success of China in developing nuclear weapons for her defense? Well, I think it's one of the greatest things that has ever happened because up until now, the nuclear devices have uh, been in the hands of Europeans. They've exercised a monopoly over the nuclear weapons or over the ability to produce nuclear weapons. But now the Chinese have evened it. They've equalized it by uh, uh, being successful, by being a non-white or non-European nation, and at the same time uh, de developing successfully uh, the ability to uh, produce nuclear weapons. So as far as I'm concerned, it was a very good thing, and I do hope that they are able to build bigger ones and better ones every day, because the only uh, language that the European power, the language of power, and a dark nation has or speak the language that these uh, imperialists understand. And China has developed uh, the ability to be in that position, and as long as she can speak the language that they understand, it's better for the other dark countries. Yes, men like this live always in the shadow of danger. He was born in white America, but his vision reaches far beyond those limits. It goes deep into the future of the black man. Today, for the first time, the black people of the West are beginning to look homeward. They're beginning to look back toward the mother continent of Africa, and they're gaining uh, spiritual strength from these roots. The African continent is on the rise. The motherland is on the rise. And our people all over the Western Hemisphere are looking back at this rising continent and the unity of that continent, and uh, it's giving us strength and hope for the future. And for the first time, not only is the black man on the African continent uh, fighting and seeking and fighting for his place in the sun, but his fight is putting the same spirit in the black people in the West, and we are also seeking and fighting for our place in the sun, and we will not rest until that place has been secured. What's your plan now? I'm going back to the uh, States first and see how my family is doing. You yes. Know, got a family there. And uh, see what develops. <laughs> In New York, on February 21st, 1965, Brother Malcolm X fell before the bullet of a... His killers were those whose interest he knew would crumble before the irresistible forces of worldwide revolution against racism and dollarism. Those who directed the murder of our courageous brother demonstrated their crazy belief that the ideas he fought for can be killed. They are wrong because the voice of Malcolm X was the voice of our humanity. The words he spoke can never be silenced. They are the words and the determination of his people, a people fighting for their place in the sun, and will never rest until that place has been secured. Speaking and fighting for our place in the sun, and we will not rest until that place has been secured.